I'm Saul Griffith from Rewiring America, a policy and advocacy shop working on the electrification of everything. And this is me talking to you about the state of electrification for Verge 2022. It's been a bad year, but I want you to know we are winning. Uh, it doesn't feel like it. There's the war in Ukraine. That's driving up energy prices. That's creating inflation as a major problem. The Supreme Court is hostile to climate action and Build Back Better appears canceled. But I want to reassure you that the macroeconomics of electrifying everything, the fact that it's inflation proof is on our side. Let's look at the global electricity supply, the, the 25 year history. Coal on its way out now. Oil and gas also appears to have turned that corner despite a recent rebound after COVID. Hydro, the historical mainstay, is still doing well. Nuclear is slowly falling off as uh, earlier plants retire. That probably won't happen forever. But the story of today is this incredible rise in solar and wind we can see since 2010 that has now surpassed nuclear energy uh, in its contributions to the global electricity supply. If you keep pushing that forward another 20 years, uh, we will in fact be able to supply the entire world's energy supply with green electricity by 2040. That means we're more on target than you might think. But we do have a guy who tells us that inflation is the reason not to electrify. And what I really want to show you now is why inflation is exactly the reason we should electrify. So for example, let's look at the historical price of electricity up and up and up and up. We can look at the underlying price of coal that generated that electricity and you can see it has been increasing increasing although because the demand for coal is going down um, the price is easing a little bit coal is definitively in the u.s on the way out you can see it dropping from close to 60 percent 25 years ago to less than 20 percent of the supply today it'll make its way out by 2030 on its own here's the retail price of gasoline compared to the underlying price of oil. You can see the very, very high volatility over the last 25 years. You can see the price spikes in 2007. Uh, you can see the price spikes that we're feeling right now at the pump. Retail gas has been pretty constant. We can see that the underlying wholesale gas uh, was going up and up through 2007, but then the fracking revolution happened. It made gas very, very cheap in the US, but we didn't really see that passed on in our retail prices, although we see the volatility and the seasonality going up. As with residential electricity, we can look over the last 25 years. The US average incredibly constant. You can see it goes up in the summer for air conditioning goes down a little bit in the winter and you can see that seasonality all the way growing from about eight cents in 97 to around 14 13 or 14 cents on average this year uh, there are states where it's lower like nebraska there are states where it's higher like california and hawaii where we have the highest uptake of rooftop solar there's a hint there is because it had the highest electricity price and so it was the place where rooftop solar was first economically competitive why don't we look at these energy prices against inflation though? In fact, the residential electricity price that you can see here nearly perfectly tracks the CPI. So why don't we actually look at the retail energy cost in cents per kilowatt hour of everything we do and compare that to the CPI. You can see electricity, pretty constant tracking the CPI. Gasoline, also if we draw the trend line, tracks the CPI pretty closely as does natural gas. And that's in fact, they are a large portion of how we calculate the consumer price index. But here's the revolution that I want to clue you into that uh, I have the advantage of seeing because I work a little bit in Australia where rooftop solar and you can see it is a dollar a watt. In the US a few years ago, it was $3 a watt. Steady progress, we're on our way to $2 a watt. Once you get, that means cost goes down from 20 cents to 13. You'll eventually see it to five to six cents a kilowatt hour, which is what Australians enjoy already today. So we know this is possible in a highly developed country. The other revolution that is happening obviously is in batteries 10 years ago if you're buying wholesale cells they were a thousand dollars a kilowatt hour out of the factory gate now they're 150 dollars a kilowatt hour less at retail they used to be two thousand dollars a kilowatt hour depending on whether it's on the side of your house or inside your car it's now 200 to 500 dollars those prices are going to keep going down what's really astonishing about that can be seen in this graph again we see electricity price rising and rising we know that there will be inflation in the future and that will continue to rise on a similar history to the last 25 years but if you buy rooftop solar and a battery today you lock in a constant price but we see that as the years progress that that price is coming down and down and down 
And so we have an inflation proof source of zero emission clean energy that is now competitive in most markets and in countries like Australia, it's competitive absolutely all day and everywhere. Here it is again, just to now talk about it in terms of the retail prices, obviously a gasoline car, you've got to penalize by a factor of three because it uses more than three times as much energy to go the same mile. Similarly with natural gas, if you can use an electric heat pump to heat your water, it uses one third the uh, energy of your natural gas. So adjusting those, you can see the retail pot cost in cents per kilowatt hour for heat, for driving, for electricity. And then I can show you that inflation proof price that's already happening in Australia and is soon to come in the US uh, is going to forever more mean that doing everything in your life with electricity is the cheapest way to do it. And it's inflation proof for 20 years into the future. Here again, here's the trend for fossil. Let's make it really basic up and up and up increasing volatility, especially into the future because we'll have more and more supply chain uh, upheaval as we're weaning ourselves off uh, in a fairly lumpy way, the remaining coal plants and the remaining natural gas. At the same time, the cost of batteries, the cost of solar, the cost of wind continues to go down faster than inflation goes up. And so as we go further and further into the future, this new competitor that will soon be incumbent just gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. You can already see it, not just uh, residentially, but on the grid as a whole. You can see coal on the way out here uh, at the bottom. You can see gas has largely replaced it, but is starting to slow down at that effort. Nuclear is fading out. Hydro is consistent. But again, since about 2010, wind absolutely rocking forward in the US and globally solar. Also since about 2015, the economics are starting to work rocketing ahead in its contributions to the grid. So if we draw those 2000 to 2020 growth curves for wind and for solar in percent of electricity supplied, we then see them shooting off into the future, providing this decade and next decade more than 50% and very soon afterwards, 100% of the energy that Americans need. No better proof of the revolution. This is not a linear transition. You can't model this in the dumb, simple way that the International Energy Agency does with some straight line. This is going to be very disruptive and the automotive companies absolutely show you that. The tailpipe goes away. We're going to plug in these cars and these are the commitments of when these major brands will go all electric. 2025 for Jaguar, 2026 for Audi, 26 for Again, for Mini, 2027 for Alfa Romeo, 2028 for Rolls-Royce, if you can afford one. And of course, we have all electric uh, companies, Tesla, BYD, already crushing it and having the best growth in their stock. Here's the inevitable trend and the reason this is happening. Everything is starting to get to scale. This is known as the Swanson's curve. This is the price reduction in solar every time we double the amount of that we produce. Basically, 20% off every time we double the global production rate. We're going to double it, double it again, and double it one more time. The same is going to happen for wind, which is falling at 14% every doubling, and 21% is the rate that batteries are coming down. Electrification cost is inevitably coming down for a long time to come. You can see in history, let's look at red dye, let's look at insulin, let's look at video, let's look at cameras, corn, nails, coal, car tires. Once the transition starts to happen within 25 years, it accelerates and is nearly done. And when you get 100% penetration of the new incumbent, this is the revolution we are seeing. It's already happening. Governments can speed it up, but they can't really slow it down. So here, let's get serious. Um, we got to say, how are we doing against our climate goals? This is the one and a half degree curve of uh, that we'd have to hit if we wanted to do no negative emissions. That's where the more than 50% target by 2030 in emissions reductions comes from. Two degrees get, buys us a, a less good climate, but a little more time. But you can see here, if we project forward the rate of those renewables being deployed along with some nuclear, we can be all electric by 2040 or 2050 and zero emission we may not be as fucked as you think. So that's one piece of the good news story. The, the industry is now on target to hit our climate goals uh, as long as we keep the, the foot to the floor and you can only expect international governments to get more ambitious in their commitments, automotive companies to get more ambitious in their commitments as time goes on. But let's turn not from the macroeconomic story, which I think is good, but let me talk about the underlying microeconomics, which I think is the most compelling reason of all to do this. Here's your house. 
here's your cars and this is what we're all going to be doing we're going to be electrifying because the economics just makes sense for your house we're going to put solar on the roof then we're going to follow it with a battery we'll electrify the load center or the fuse box will electrify the kitchen the water heater the heating the first car the second car and that means your household will go from a picture like this where today every month you send a check to the electricity company that money leaves your house it leaves your suburb then you also buy gasoline every week that's money that leaves your house leaves your suburb doesn't create very many jobs where you live if any at all you buy natural gas to heat your home that also, that's money that leaves your house, leaves your zip code, probably leaves your state, not really benefiting your house at all. Let's fast forward to the future. Here's your same house. Now you have solar on the roof. It's receiving that free sunshine. You had to invest in it, yes. You'll only need to buy a small amount of electricity from the grid. That'll still have to happen just to make sure it works all year round and all day long. But the money you've invested in your rooftop solar and the electrification is going to be savings returned to your household. In the US, those savings by 2030 could be as easily be as two to four thousand dollars per year per household. That's a good story for your house, but remember your house lives in a community. You live in a community. Electricity is literally the thing that connects us, physically connects every household, uh, everything we do as a community. In 2022, your community is spending, if you know, if you think of a community or a suburb as about a thousand households, uh, they're spending about twenty million dollars a year on fossil fuels, and that's it. that's money on a one-way ticket outside of your community. If we rather invest in your community, invest in the electrification of your community, by twenty thirty-two, the majority of that twenty million dollars could be returning in a virtuous circle back in your community, and of course. That means local savings, that's gonna buy new classrooms, that's gonna buy new swimming pools, that's gonna pave the roads, and it's gonna create a huge number of jobs. The virtuous circle of electrification is that it works locally and improves every community. This is the abundance agenda, electrification. Part of that abundance is we don't no longer have to think about just trying really hard to get 100% renewable. We have to think about true abundance over supply. Here's how the US will electrify. Industry grinds along constantly year round. The commercial sector uses a little more heat in the winter, a little more air conditioning in the summer, and a little more heat in the winter again. And you can see the shape of that curve. We drive roughly the same amount all year round. So transportation just goes on top. And our residential loads look like our commercial loads. That means we need more heat again in the winter, more electricity and cooling in the summer, and more heat in the winter again. So, how do we supply this energy? Well, let's look at what the renewables are gonna do for us. Of course, we'll still have some nuclear, we'll still have some hydro, we'll still have some biofuels in small amounts, but the majority of the energy supply in the future is gonna be wind. Wind is at a minimum in the winter, peaks in, in the middle seasons in spring and in autumn. Uh, and of course, solar peaks in the summer. So if we superimpose all of that solar, all of that wind, we can actually come to a new idea of why don't we design the whole system for that peak winter demand. And if we do that, we find that we only need to build 10 to 20% oversupply, 10 to 20% abundance to get there. That will be cheaper than batteries, that'll be cheaper than storage, and that will free energy for much of the year will provide enormous numbers of new business opportunities and genuine abundance, not just for America, but for the whole world. We need to no longer think about just getting to 100% renewables. We need to think 120. Electrification is the antidote to inflation. It is the vaccine against climate change. Electrification is the abundance agenda. It's good climate policy. It's good economic policy. It's good for our communities and it's good for our health. Thank you.